Hi, my name's Andy Kirk. I'm a freelance data visualization expert based in the UK. And in this presentation, I'm going to talk to you about the visualization of qualitative data. And I'm going to look at this through several perspectives. In a while, I'll go through some different examples of qualitative visualizations. But before that, I want to touch on perhaps what is the, the secret of working with qualitative data, which really is about the collection, the classifying, and the transformation of your data. To begin with, let's just step back and think about the different types of data that we might ever encounter or work with. And this is a taxonomy that I often use to get a sense of the range of different data types that I have potentially to work with and to analyze. And this taxonomy comes from social science, more so than perhaps database thinking. And as you can see, there are three distinct um, major groups, and then within those subtle distinctions in classifications, qualitative, categorical, and quantitative. But within that little subtle differences between, for example, qualitative media. So when you've got the possibility of working with data that's unstructured, such as videos, photo imagery, audio, music, unstructured text, maybe in written form, such as articles, um, survey comments, quotations, categorical nominal data, is a grouping device where you've got different and distinct memberships. So these things are different to those things. There's a separation. Countries, team names, brands, departments. Ordinal categories still have that grouping essence, but there's now discrete levels, perhaps sequences or hierarchies. So for example, in the Olympics, gold is better than silver. Silver is better than bronze in terms of medals. In survey design, the Likert scale from agreement to disagreement is an ordinal category. For quantities, we've got these subtle distinctions between interval and ratio. Both are concerned with magnitude, the size of something, but the interval quantities are based on the position along a quantitative scale. So for example, temperature, in Celsius or Fahrenheit, where the zero does not mean there's nothing of that thing. It is just a position on a scale. Whereas quantitative ratio values are measurements. They are counts of something. Prices, ages, populations, where the zero does mean there's nothing of that thing. So that's the different data types that we might end up working with. But I think what's important is when you've got qualitative data, generally speaking, to work with that analytically and visually, you need to convert it, transform it, or extract from it categories and quantities. And then you visualize those properties. A couple of examples. The first is a project I worked on um, over the last few years and published last year in 2020. And this is a visualization of Seinfeld, the sitcom. And what I was trying to do was to, to get an understanding of the rhythm, the architecture, the structure, the way that the writers and the producers of the show sort of used a, a formula or methodology to, to construct the use of characters and the use of dialogue and the use of comedy within each episode. Now, the thing about this is the, the data in a spreadsheet form did not exist. It required me to collect it. Well, it required me and my brother-in-law, Rob, who's the real hero of the piece. Collectively, we worked on the gathering of the data by quantifying it and categorizing it ourselves. We watched every episode 176 and throughout each episode over the course of the timeline we captured moments we captured which characters were in the scene 
Which characters achieved a laugh? What was the scene structure? And what locations were used within the set of each scene? So by way of example, looking at the different timelines, different structures, characters and laughs and the locations, these were the questions that I was asking and my brother-in-law Rob was asking as we watched every episode. And we used a spreadsheet to manually log these events and these moments and these counts and these categorizations. So here's an example of a scene. In this scene, we are in the diner. So we have a little marker against the di diner row to indicate that that is the continuous location within this scene. At the moment, in this scene, there are three characters, Jerry, George, and Kramer. And so Jerry, George, and Kramer each get a number one for this five-second interval that we see on screen. This is scene number 22 in this episode, which is episode 14 of season five. Now, in this five-second um, moment, there's no laughter. George is telling a story. Five seconds later, George is still telling the story, but there's now a moment of laughter. And so against George, we have a number one for a laughter that's been caused. And by the way, the reason for the five seconds is that that seemed to be the most logical unit of time to log an event because that was how long most laughters took place, happened, and then subsided. We move forward again. And now Elaine, the fourth main character, has arrived in the scene. So she now gets a number one against her name. And George is giving another moment of comedy, laughter. Jumping forward, the story that he's telling builds and builds and builds. And there's still the four characters in the scene. It's still scene 22. And once again, there's a little moment in the story when there's no laughter. But then we build to the crescendo of the story. And the big reveal of this anecdote, which is basically about the idea that George has rescued a whale because the whale had a golf ball trapped in its blowhole. And Kramer was the cause of that golf ball. He was hitting some, some shots on the beach. And so as the big reveal happens, we actually get 15 seconds of continuous laughter. There's no dialogue but the laughter happens for 15 seconds. So this is not perfect. This is not scientific, but this is a reasonable subjective judgment of the characters, the locations, and the laughter that took place across this timeline period in this episode. But it's our translation. Another example, in this case, looking at a qualitative textual document. This is a document uh, published by the EU, the EU Council. And I've done some work with them and they asked me to visualize or at least to redesign the information in this document about negotiations amongst certain EU countries regarding fisheries and whether they want to increase the number of fish types captured, stay the same, or maybe reduce the numbers. So this two-page spread gives you a sense of the raw material that I was working with. So again, the task with this qualitative textual document is to translate it, to extract from it, to convert it. Specifically, to read through that content and to find the countries in yellow, to find the fishing stocks in green, and then to find the negotiation positions in purple or pink, which says, again, do you want to fish for more, the same, or for fewer? Taking that extracted data into a tabular form then makes it more organized, more structured. And eventually when you sort of finesse the design, the appearance, it makes it more accessible to quickly understand what the positions of each country are regarding all the different fishing stocks. So once again, we are intervening with a transformation stage to take that qualitative document and extract from it the quantities, and in this case, especially the categories. 
So when you are working with qualitative data, and again, it can be media, it can be text, it can be audio, you are doing really the job to take that data and transform it into either categories. And here's just a, a few examples of the different type of transformations that you might do to identify keywords or themes, instances of something happening, relationships, uh, sentiments, word types and structures, the kind of use of language, or even just the components of qualitative data. For quantitative transformations, you are counting things or the frequency of things, um, analyzing the attributes such as the total words used, the physical length, the reading duration, the numbers of sentences or paragraphs, they are kind of higher level statistical summaries. Maybe you're looking at the moments in a temporal sense, like when did something happen? Or in a spatial sense, where did something happen? Perhaps where in the, in the duration of a text passage did something occur in that text? So this is what I want to get across really, is that the secret to visualizing qualitative data isn't really about the unique branch of different chart types that you can only use with qualitative data. It's more about this intervention, this transformation. Having established that, what I want to do now is just switch to give you some examples of qualitative visualizations, but using chart types that are, are common to many different types of data, many different types of analysis, many different curiosities that you might have. And I'm, I'm organizing these by these five distinct families that really kind of spell out an acronym, C-H-R-T-S, categorical, hierarchical, relational, temporal, and spatial. These are different ways to organize chart types based on primarily what it is you are trying to show people. So first up in the categorical family, just a few examples. This is a piece of analysis that looks at simply the length of the word counts as used in the terms and conditions that we often quite casually take and agree with for various um, social media uh, accounts such as Instagram, Facebook, um, Snapchat, Google, all these different terms of conditions. And you can see just by the sheer magnitude and size of these printouts, just how many words are used. So in effect, it's like a, a, a physical bar chart. This next piece looks at people's recognition of different potential candidates as it was back then in the democratic 2020 primaries. In this case, what was done to collect the data was to ask people, which of these faces do you recognize? And they used a, a kind of a, a pencil to, to sketch around the faces of the people they recognize. And then the designers from the Washington Post overlaid all these sketches to indicate through the kind of the busier patterns, the more sort of dark patterns, the candidates that were most recognized. So people like Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden were most commonly recognized. Some were far less recognizable. So again, it's, it's more about the intensity of the patterns that indicates the counts of the recognized candidates. This next project analyzes words, specifically the words used for passwords. This is based on a hacked data set comprising 720 million unique passwords. So again, the inquiry in this case is to look at the use of certain digits, certain combinations, certain lengths, certain positions within the passwords of non-standard characters or non-numeric or alphanumeric characters. So again, it's almost like looking at the physicality of the words, even though they are in and of themselves a qualitative item of data, it's about looking at them through the lens of the physicality. This next piece explores the number of unique words used by different artists, um, looking at 
this range of different um, rappers and all sorts of different kind of R&B musicians, and it analyzes the first 35,000 35, lyrics from their music to detect how wide their vocabulary is, or in this case, perhaps how narrow it is. So in this, again, in a sense, the analysis of the words used is to count the frequency of unique words or terms, and then plot that in what we call a bee swarm plot. This is a really interesting piece of analysis by an organization called YouGov, which asks people to rate on a scale of zero through to 10, whether each of these words, these English words, generally mean something that's more positive or more negative in its connotation. So what you see with these density plots is the, the general spread and range of scores given by the people taking part in the survey. So those where the sort of mountains are higher to the left were on average rated as a more negative word. Those in the middle, sort of more yellow or orange or kind of mid, mid words. And those that are green and more to the right were generally scored as being more positive words. This next piece is from The Economist by Ross Pierce, and it looks at the, the mood of music as streamed by different people around the world. So on average, uh, February is the saddest month based on the mood of the music streamed globally. And July is, generally speaking, the happiest month overall, with a particular spike around Christmas. But then you break it down by each country and you can see this spread of the countries with, on average, quite sad music being the dominant, uh, dominant theme, which is, in this case, Hong Kong. And then moving through the list, you can see the Netherlands kind of in the middle, bottom third. But then Peru is a very, very happy country. Even the saddest music is far more uplifting than most of the other countries across most of the months of the year. This next piece is a unique bespoke visualization that creates a symbol in effect to indicate the guests attending the wedding of Amy and Xander. First of all, who do you know the most? So what's the amount of time you've spent with each of those people? And that gives you a sense of the balance of the heart and whether it kind of goes big on one side. And then the color is how you know them. Is it based on family, friends, childhood, college, colleagues at work? So each person at the wedding attending had a badge with a unique shape to indicate who they knew best, why they knew each person, and for how long. A really nice, uh, nice icebreaker, especially when you sat at tables with people you don't know very well, it's a nice icebreaker to work out, well, how do you know Amy? How do you know Xander? In the hierarchical family, which is about part to whole relationships and hierarchies, the stat bar chart. The stat bar chart is the classic device used to show perceptions. In this case, um, analysis in Australia, asking people to what extent do you trust or distrust different political parties, different institutions, different organizations. So the split across each bar gives you a sense of the red, which is the distrust, and then the blue, which is the trust. And then the, the gray is a, yeah, neither one nor the other. So you then get a nice sense of the, of the perceptions across these different organizations. This next view is more of a hierarchical display which looks at the, the UK skills taxonomy produced by Kath Sleeman of Nesta. And so the idea is that across these different major themes or topics of jobs and occupations, you've got these different branches that slightly more specifies the type of roles that might exist. And then the skills cluster at the end gives you the specific skills that you might need to show, demonstrate or possess to be able to get a job in those different roles. So it's effectively an organization diagram from the highest tier 
to the next tier down and then the categories below that. And this was conducted based on analyzing job adverts and the profiles listed to get a sense of what most employers are seeking from people applying for different jobs. Now, the previous example was what we call a dendrogram, and that was a linear dendrogram that goes from left to right, collapsing down the tiers. This is an example of a radial dendrogram that starts in the center and then works outwards into this sequence of tiers in a circular structure. And this is looking at the Indic languages and the different structures of how the origins of languages have evolved over time and branched off into unique dialects around um, kind of Indian countries. So again, it's an organization chart that shows you different tiers, different structures, and probably quite a subjective classification method. In the relational family, looking at relationships in terms of correlations and connections. The first example comes from my Seinfeld analysis. So having collected all that data about moments of laughter, this analysis looked at all the episodes for each of the main four characters. And on the X axis, what was the intensity, the rate of laughter that they caused? So for the, based on the amount of time that they were on screen in episode, how much of that time was causing laughter? The y-axis is the share of laughter within each episode. So within the episode that they were on screen within, the laughter that they caused or they were allocated, how does that compare to the other characters who were in the same episode and the amount of laughter that they were given by the writers. What this means is that the higher up the y-axis and the further along the x-axis indicates a sense of their peak performance because they were very funny in terms of the time that they were on screen, they were being funny, and also they were given the most laughs within that episode. This next piece is a network diagram, and it's quite a complicated piece of analysis. It's looking at the partisanship across the US House of Representatives over time. And not to get too into the details of the metrics or the calculations, what you're looking at really is a node is an individual member of the House of Representatives. The red are the Republicans, the blue are the Democrats. And the clusters indicate whether, essentially, over the course of the, the voting that takes place in their term, do they vote with their party, partisan, or do they cooperate and cross the aisle? So the more that the clusters are overlapping indicates a much more cooperative environment politically. The more that those clusters separate indicates that things become ever more partisan. So as with any network diagram, you're not really as a reader looking at the specific details of an individual dot or the connection lines. It's more about the overall systems and the separation or the overlaps. This next graphic looks at the connected stories of characters across the Game of Thrones, specifically from season three. Now, it's not actually a show, let me admit, I've seen much of. As you can see, I've been far too busy analyzing Seinfeld. But in this case, you've got all these characters and the connections show whether they are rated by love or hate or by family. And it builds up this overall system to understand how everything has been joined together through the storylines of the shows in that particular season. This is a really interesting piece of analysis by Jan Willem Tulp, which looks at across 48 hours in a hospital situation, all the different people in that hospital, the patients, the caregivers, the physicians, nurses, ward assistants, across 48 hours, how many occasions do they encounter each other? So you've got all these little nodes on the outside, which are individual people, 
And in the main view, we are focusing on the nurses and all these strands that leave the nurse nodes and join up with the other characters indicate a moment of interaction. Now, this is a chord diagram and chord diagrams are always complex looking, but the inquiry is complex. So it's usually again, like the network diagram about the general patterns, about the dominant strands, about the empty areas. In fact, what's quite interesting to me is that there is one physician that's had no interactions with anybody for 48 hours. There are two patients that have had no interactions with anybody else for 48 hours. And that to me, is perhaps a little bit of concern. But anyway, we'll not worry about it for now. The temporal chart family, looking at discrete and continuous trends over time. The first is analysis of the frequency and the dominance of different words and when they were used over time in Scientific American, the monthly magazine that dates back to the 1840s, 1850s. And so this work by Marich Steffner and other members of his team looked at the, the prevalence of words as used. And you can see this big canvas in the background is the sort of small multiple views that looks across each of the decades for the dominant words within those decades. But then you see this little smaller view in the main panel there. And you can see the, the sort of ebb and flow, but also moments of absolute dominance for words like certainty, interpret, see. And the, the, the bigger project is really interesting in how language has changed and the different themes from kind of mechanics to engineering to, to technology and to people, to humans. It's a really interesting piece of work. Back to my Seinfeld analysis. This, in, in a sense, was the core inquiry, deconstructing every episode to get a sense across time, the scene structure, the characters and their appearances on screen, their moments of laughter, and also below that, when the different locations were used across those scenes. So this almost kind of gives you a sense of the, the musicality and the instrumentation used within each episode. This piece looks at the use of language over time, and it's by the president of the US, and the frequency of words used during their State of the Union address, the kind of annual speech that they give. So the bigger the bubbles just indicates the more frequency of those particular words over time. The colours indicate the party of the president that was giving the speech. So again, it's not really about the precise reading, it's more about the, the general patterns of when does it get very big, very small, even empty. I mean, you can see on screen just how how kind of almost infrequent the use of the word democracy is compared to words like America or freedom, world, employment. And on the same kind of topic, politics, this is a very interesting display that looks at the, the career pathways of all the members of the House of Representatives. What's the story of how they arrived into the world of politics? Did they originate straight from um, college, from university? Was it from their kind of graduation, masters, doctorate, law schools? Did they work in private industry, education, sport? Were they actors? So this is a, a, a bunch of different lines that shows the career pathways leading to their ultimate jobs as politicians. In the last family, looking at spatial patterns through overlays and distortions. The first analysis, again, from the realm of politics or specifically um, the US Supreme Court, this looks at the hearing of Brett Kavanaugh and the, the testimonies that he and uh, Blasey Ford gave. And what you've got here are transcripts of their answers to questions during the testimonies. And somebody is, well, I know who it was, Alvin Chan from Vox at the time. Alvin has gone through these transcripts to indicate the moments when each of the people involved answered the question that was raised with them in blue. 
or avoided answering the question that was raised with them in pink. And you can see not just the length of, of the testimonies through the size, but also how on the left-hand side, it's all blue. On the right-hand side, there are bits of blue, but there's far more pink that suggests that there were moments of evasion. This is, in some respects, a grotesque piece of work, but also brilliant. Kate McLean is um, a smell analyst, and she visits locations and places, sometimes with a team of volunteers, to capture evidence of different smells and odours. Now, this one was done in a hospital uh, corridor, which feels to me like a horrible prospect. But what you've got here is this very kind of fluid analysis of where these smells were detected around the kind of operating theatres, the wards, the main entrances, the canteens, the toilets, the waiting rooms. So in a sense, it's a geographical display. It's not precise in terms of geographic precision, but it's a rough sense of where the different orders were detected. And then another example of geographic analysis looks at the use of language. Specifically, this is a dialect quiz map. And the idea is that you are asked over 25 questions to indicate what term of language you would use in this particular scenario or situation. As you submit your answers, the model behind the scenes then evaluates what it thinks you are likely to come from, in this case, in Britain. So it is based on qualitative responses. It is based on an underlying database of studies conducted in the past. And then as you complete the piece, you can then say, yes, you are correct in your estimate. Or no, actually, I come from this part of the world and it becomes a self-improving system. So those are some of the key issues around classifying, collecting, converting, extracting, and transforming your qualitative data. And then some different examples across the different five families of chart types to give you a sense of how you might convey that visually. Thanks for watching.